Welcome to the show. Welcome, welcome. We welcome here Bill Pito. If you know Knicks basketball, you know Rangers hockey, you know who Bill Pito is, one of the best at it in the business with MSG Networks. The one and only Bill Pito. What's going on? How you doing, Max? Uh, thank you for having me on. Oh, of course, St. John's University. Have you had the chance to work for any St. John's games throughout your career? I have not. I actually went to uh, talk to some students a handful of years ago. Is Glenn still there? No, he's not. Len Gerstener, what was his last? You know who I'm talking about? No, I, everyone's changed over. If it was in the sports department at St. John's, the communications department, maybe. The communications department yeah. probably changed. Yeah. What year are you there? Right now, I'm actually graduating in a few weeks. They're letting us walk. Oh. I'm oh, okay. right now a senior, a graduating senior. Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I want to get into your start, but being born in New York, because eventually you went out to California. Yeah, so I'm originally from Manhattan. Mm -hmm. uh, all of my family is either uh, New York City, Long Island. Uh, we moved west when I was seven. Uh, my dad was a consultant. He, he's, he got moved. His company got bought by a company in, in Northern California. And uh, my mom, who uh, had been, been in New York her whole life, couldn't sleep because it was so quiet in the suburbs. <laughs> So we moved west when in 1972, uh, and then uh, we stayed out there until I came back east to go to Cornell uh, for college, graduating in 1987. Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. Right. Uh, you know, the one thing I would tell people, uh, yourself included, is that the degree in college is not that important to pursue this. Yeah. Uh, it's more of what you're doing now, trying to get experience, presenting your material, it, 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 this is a, a can-do, show-me type of business where you're going to have to submit some type of tape. Uh, so the degree is not as important as the practical experience. And thankfully, at Cornell, because there weren't a ton of people like it at Syracuse who wanted to do what I wanted to do, there's a lot of opportunity to get really valuable experience. And that prepared me to get my first job in Binghamton. Uh, I was a sportscast with a CBS affiliate in the late 80s in Binghamton. And that's how I got my start. And after Binghamton, you went to work for TV station in Syracuse. I went to WSTM in Syracuse mm -hmm. for six months. Then I uh, was at the, a network called the Mislu Sports News Network, which was just a little bit ahead of its time. It was 24-hour sports news in 1990. If we had been five years later, Max, we would have been a huge hit because uh, <laughs> the owners and the producers were just a little bit ahead of their time. People said, what are you doing 24 hours sports news? But five years later, that became what everybody was doing. Unfortunately, that network only lasted uh, 10 months. And then I basically had to start all over again. Yeah. <laughs> I was on the unemployment line in Hackensack, New Jersey. Uh, I went to the high school show as a freelancer at ESPN. Uh, one of the executives from the Mislu network that folded hired me in Boston at the regional news channel, uh, New England Cable News. I was a sportscaster on that regional news channel. Then I was able to audition for uh, ESPN in 1993. I didn't get the first job, but then I was hired for ESPN2 in August of 93. I was at ESPN for 15 years and have been at MSG since 2009. So that is my path. And there's a lot of bumps along the way, um, a lot of perseverance, but it's been a great experience as a native New Yorker to work at MSG. Uh, when I was a little boy in New York, before we moved West, that's when the Knicks were this incredible team in the early seventies. So to be the Knicks host is, uh, is a huge thrill, huge mm -hmm. thrill for me. That's back when they were winning championships and actually good. I mean, this year was a breath of fresh air, but I look at it this way. When you guys are in the studio, how do you handle these rough nights after a Knicks loss over and over and over again? It's just, I, you got to feel bad for you guys to have to cover it every night. I know, but hey, Max, we had a great year. And yeah, we did. We're emphasizing. I don't know if you saw the crowd outside of MSG after they won game two against the Hawks, mm -hmm. but they had to shut down seventh Avenue. <laughs> I mean, that's how starved this team is for, for a winner. And I think they're on the right track. I, I really think so do. too. I, I think if they get themselves a starting point guard, uh, that, that's going to be the key thing that they have to figure out. Uh, they play hard every night. They're very easy to root for. They got a great coach, and I think there are Great days ahead. They got the 19th pick overall, the 21st pick overall, the 32nd pick overall. Uh, they got tons of room under the cap. I think uh, very bright days are ahead. I think so, too. Damian Lillard is a great possibility if they make the trade. I'm hearing with them hiring out there in, in Portland, 
Chauncey Billups that he's not happy. Well, we'll see. I, I don't know if I want to, you know, mortgage a future for Damian Lillard. And as great as he is, he's 31. He's owed a ton of money over the next three years. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you do that. I mean, would you have to give up Mitch Robinson and RJ maybe and or quickly and a bunch of draft picks? I don't know. I don't know if I'd do that. I might, I might try to get a point guard here, like a Spencer Dinwiddie or somebody like that, and try to roll that way. Spencer Dinwiddie is definitely an option. He was a great player for Brooklyn. He won't be returning, supposedly. And the Knicks may be a great fit for him, but what about Lonzo Ball? He's also a choice. Yeah, I think Dinwiddie might be cheaper because Dinwiddie's coming off an ACL injury. Mm -hmm. And Dinwiddie is taller. And I think Dinwiddie may be a more a complete player than Ball. Mm -hmm. The Knicks have got to get a point guard, in my opinion, that can shoot mm -hmm. the ball consistently. We saw what happens with Peyton. Uh, Rose is not the greatest outside shooter, although he was improved from three-point land. I think they need someone who can shoot the ball better than Lonzo Ball. I think they need to bring back Rose on a two-year deal. I would do it because you saw him as soon as he was traded to the Knicks on Super Bowl Sunday from the Pistons. He brought a new energy to that team. And Randall even, I think it made him in a better environment for the Knicks. No question. Uh, you know, you got Rose maybe a couple years. Uh, what do you do with Bullock, Noel, and Burks? Think about this, Max. Burks mm -hmm. made $6 million. Noel made $5 million. Bullock made $4 million. You talk about value. Now, these guys are going to deserve a raise, so we'll see what happens. I don't know, maybe as good as Noel was, if you think you got Taj Gibson uh, as a backup, Norvell Pell as a backup, maybe you don't pay uh, New Orleans Noel as good as he was. So there's very interesting decisions to be made. They can't go over the cap to do Burks because of the, the rules with a salary cap, but they can go over the cap to keep Bullock. They do have Bullock's bird rights, so that could be a factor in how those things work out. On top of a point guard, I'd love to see that, them have a shooter because that's what was the problem against Atlanta, too. Atlanta Hawks, they have all these shooters. Bogdanovich, you see that the guys that they have on there, they outgun the Knicks. We would love to have a Steve Novak back on the court. I think that's a great call. I, you know, you get a knockdown three-ball shooter. The Hawks have Herter. They got Gallo. Mm -hmm. They have Bogdanovich. Uh, when DeAndre Hunter, they, people talk about Trey Young being hurt, but Hunter's also out. And Hunter was huge against the Knicks on defense. Oh, yeah. The Hawks are a good team. You know, you got they Trey are. Young uh, penetrating, doing his thing, Capella can roll, and you got all those wings that can shoot. So, yeah, I'm with you. Point guard, first priority, knockdown shooter, second priority. Mm -hmm. For Mitchell Robinson, I feel as though that the Knicks, they really didn't miss him once he went out because Noel filled in nicely, Todd Gibson filled in nicely for him. Do you feel as though we could package him up in a deal and it wouldn't hurt the Knicks as much? Potentially. Uh, but then you have to say, okay, who's going to be the center? Uh, Robbins had a rough year. I, I, he only played half the games. Yeah. The one thing, though, is he, he's got a deal here, $1.6 million for the next year. So he's got good value for the next year. He does. Uh, I, I, that, you know, I, I don't know. That's going to be an interesting decision about Mitch. I think Mitch could really help them against the Hawks. I think he may have been able to do a better job on Capella than, than the guys that, that played. You thought that the finals were going to be the Nets and the Clippers. I uh, thank God it wasn't the Nets because as a Nick fan, I, I just can't root for that team. And you're did someone I say that. Yeah. <laughs> did I say that? I've watched you in other interviews. <laughs> I'm glad I'm wrong. Oh, uh, I'm so glad the Nets didn't win. Yeah. Well, I, I am too, because I I'm a true diehard Knicks fan. I've been a Knicks fan my whole life and they come in here, here they come in. What was it? 2011, 2012, when they came in here to the Brooklyn here, Jay-Z helped out at the Barkley center to get them in Brooklyn. And all of a sudden there's this uprising of fans in Brooklyn. All of a sudden they think they're the number one New York team. And but they don't have traction, Max, you know, as good as they are. I, I just, I just think it is, and it will always be at least this point, a Knicks town. Mm -hmm. I agree with you on that. I just don't understand why the players such as KD and Kyrie Irving all wanted to team up and go to Brooklyn. Where Why wouldn't you want to play in the Mecca of basketball? I don't know. But you know what? It didn't work out, right? Irving got hurt. Uh, Harden was compromised. And Durant's shoes are too big. <laughs> Durant's shoes were a little small. That would have been a three and it would have won the series. What a, what a finish that was. Oh, they were but that I, close. You know, look, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't love uh, how they were assembled. Uh, you know, Kyrie getting his way out of Boston, Harden forging his way out of Houston. I'm a Knicks guy, so yeah. I, I'm really glad it, it worked out the way it did. Yeah, I am too. I, I just couldn't believe it, how close that they were to winning that game. They just wouldn't 
they wouldn't let up. They kept coming back in the game no matter what Chris Middleton did on the other side of the court, knocking down big shots. All of a sudden, here comes KD, makes that incredible shot. People are comparing him to Michael Jordan and all this stuff. I guarantee you Michael Jordan wouldn't have airballed that last shot either. That's a good point. And more, you know, they had uh, the Nets had the advantage during that overtime. Mm-hmm. Like the Milwaukee was dead, it looked like in the OT, but then they pulled it out. And I tell you, you know, the news about Giannis today with no structural damage in the knee, but I don't know if he's going to be able to play anytime soon. I mean, that thing is that was a that terrible bad. Tweet. Thankfully, it doesn't look like he's going to need surgery. It looks like the ligaments are okay, but I don't know if he's going to be be back anytime soon. No. The carnage here with these injuries is just unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I, it's. It's ruining the league. You know, all these superstar players who are injured, it it makes it unwatchable at times. Even for baseball, you look at the injuries that are going on in baseball this year. How unwatchable is baseball this year? It's insane. But with the Knicks, you mentioned the fan reaction outside of game two. They were screaming, we want Brooklyn. We want Brooklyn. The fans are going so nuts this year. A fan spit on Trey Young. The Knicks fan base, I feel as though, is back. The spirit is finally back after all these years after 2013, because I always say that I was the last time I was a happy Knicks fan was when I was in middle school, eighth grade. I'm now graduating college and now the Knicks are back on track. Do you feel like it took a while for people to really believe and buy in? Mm-hmm. I it didn't seem like, it seemed like it really picked up momentum down the stretch in the playoffs. Like, you know what, we can get on this train. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know if you've sensed that, but I sensed as the season wore down, went wore down there toward the stretch and then the playoff series against Atlanta. I mean, people were really, really on board and MSG was electric. Like it hasn't been in years, uh, even pre COVID the, the place, the, it felt like the building was going to, was going to come off its foundation. So boy, next year ought to be really exciting. Oh, uh, the, the Knicks, there's no crowd like Madison square garden. And you would know that for working with the Knicks and MSG, especially when you heard all the F Trey young chants out there, that's how, you know, New York basketball's back. How about uh, nailing him for his hairline too? Oh yeah. <laughs> his Trae receiving young hairline or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that's the New York Knicks fan base. It, that's what it is. But I can't wait to see what they do in this year's draft. They have three important picks. I'll tell you that. And they may package some of those picks for a player or maybe, maybe even trading up. Draft is such a crap shoot. You know, you look over this, how it's gone, you know, Kevin Knox, you could have had bridges there. Boy, wouldn't you love to have Mikhail bridges on this team? hundred percent. Neil Akeen is probably done, uh, but you get a huge break with Mitch Robinson. He looks to be a keeper. Uh, jury's out on Obi Toppin. Mm-hmm. RJ Barrett's a keeper. I just you, quickly, you get a big breakdown there at number 25 overall. I just think it's like rolling the dice. So, you know, hopefully they get some, maybe they move up, whatever it is, hopefully they get a player or two that can help. Uh, maybe, maybe you get a, that point guard in free agency and maybe you get a couple guys that can shoot in the draft. I'm hoping whatever improves this Knicks team, but we'll have to see. Phil Jackson messed up big time on Nilakina, and there's still fans calling to keep him on this team. I think Nilakina and Knox, they have to go. If I'm making the decisions, they, you got to start bringing in players that can provide something off the bench. Well, Frank's up, uh, but Knox has another year on his deal. I don't know if anybody will take Knox. Um, you know, earlier in the year, Knox seemed like he was okay as a three-ball shooter, mm-hmm. and then obviously completely fell out of the rotation. Obi Toppin, I don't know what he is because that outside shot, although he did get better in the postseason, I don't know if he's a guy that's going to have to face up and create off the dribble, which he hasn't really been able to do. His outside shot is up and down. He doesn't have much yet of a post game. Hopefully they can they can get get him going on rolling to the basket and also in transition because he obviously has tremendous athleticism. Hopefully he can improve some of these things uh, to take the next step next year. And you know what, Max, as you know, I don't think they thought Randall was going to be what he was going to be. And I think they initially took Toppin to be Randall's replacement. (laughs) I think it would be great if Randall and Toppin could ultimately play together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tibbs has been reluctant to do that, but I think that would be good. I think so too. I agree with you on that. And you bring up Randall. This was a guy that the Knicks fans wanted out of town last year, but all of a sudden he's become the superstar player. He did disappoint me in the playoffs big time. What is your take on his performance in the playoffs? Well, I just think the Hawks did a great job uh, defending him. Um, you know, the Knicks, it's interesting. They have the option of 20 million to pick up. Randall can make more money waiting to sign an extension and going unrestricted next summer than this summer. Mm-hmm. 
So that will be really interesting to see if the Knicks make an extension offer and Randall turns that down so he can maximize how much he can make next year. That's going to be another key piece of this offseason. You know the Knicks are picking up the option at $20 million, but what's going to happen after next year in terms of will they sign him now? Will Randall take less now? Or will he roll the dice and wait for as much money as he can get next summer? I think that may be the case. I think he's going to wait till next summer. Every, all the NBA players, they I get it. They want their money. But at the same time, I would love to see a team come together and put aside the money sometimes to win, to win like the Knicks. I think if Julius Randle said, let's get some players in here and I'll be willing to take less money. He would go down as one of the greatest basketball players, just based the fact that he won the Knicks a championship. Yeah. But you know what, Max, they have so much cap room. I don't think it, you know, Randall next year, regardless is going to be on the books for 20 million. Yeah. But that doesn't impact the cap next year. And they got tons of cap space. Mm -hmm. Who's your top Nick of all time. Well, I, 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 you know, I work with him and I'm biased. Walt Frazier. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, he just was so uh, transcendent. And, you know, back when I was a little boy in Manhattan, and, and you have to understand this Nick team was popular even among non-basketball fans. Mm -hmm. So my mom, for example, loved Clyde Frazier to the, you know, always just say, Billy, you know what's great about him? He never looks like he's sweating. Mm -hmm. You know, he's so cool. I mean, these guys were so transcendent and, you know, my mom died, unfortunately, years ago. If she knew I was working with Clyde Frazier, I, I'm, I don't think she'd, she'd believe it, you know, because uh, of what they represented in New York city in the early seventies, they were, they were just much more than basketball players. And my condolences to the loss of your mother. She would be proud of being a Knicks fan and being a supporter of Walt Frazier and the fact that her son works alongside a legendary player such as that. That's legendary. And you know what? He's Max, he's the coolest guy in the world. He is just so approachable, so cool. He's still cool. He's low key. And, uh, you know, working at MSG, not only do you have the Knicks, but I work around Hall of Famers, Mike Breen, Sam Rosen, and Joe Micheletti on the hockey side. We got Kenny Albert. That's we right. Got Wally Zerbiak. We got Alan Hahn, John Giannone, Steve Alicetti. It's a great crew. And we got, you know, I don't know if you look at the hockey much, but the Rangers have a ton of young talent. I mean, I think there's some really exciting times ahead for both of these teams. Mm -hmm. I, the Rangers, I think they're going to make a, a better leap next year because it was obvious that they were missing Lundqvist. It was obvious. I think that's a really good point. I think when you watch greatness like Lundqvist on a night-to-night -night basis, you kind of take it for granted. Mm -hmm. If the guy was worth saving one goal a game, think about the difference that made overall in the season. They got a lot of young talent. Of course, they have a new coach in Gerard Gallant. Got to get some veteran leadership, some veteran toughness. And I think that will allow the Rangers to take the next step next season. Something I think that would be important is if one of our teams did win. And I, I've had this conversation of, with other people that's been on my show. Where is our Milwaukee Bucks? Where is our team that wins championships and takes it to the next level? Where Where is that team for New York? And it's just not here. Not even the Yankees, surprisingly. Yeah, I, I'm not... Uh, big baseball guy, but the Yankees are, are struggling. But hey, the Knicks could be on the right path. I mean, mm -hmm. who's to say that next year, year after, they're not the team that's in the Eastern Conference final? Look at the Hawks. The Hawks had a lot of down years. They drafted well. They had some really key signings here this offseason. Look where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, you got Trey Young, you acquire Capella, you get Gallo, you got Herder in the draft. Who thought Kevin Herder would be able to do this? Bogdanovich was a great acquisition. So, it, you know, the beauty about basketball is it doesn't take much. Maybe no. they get a top flight point guard. Maybe they hit it in the draft. And, and who's to say they're not a, a contender next year? Who knows? Yeah, I, I hope they are. I said the same thing after 2013 when they lost to the Pacers in the second round of the Eastern Conference Finals. I said, the Knicks are going to be back next year. And all of a sudden, they're not back. <laughs> well, the problem was is that team had the veterans. Remember, Jason they were retired. old. They had Rasheed Wallace. They had Kurt Thomas. They didn't have a lot of the young talent that this group has. And I no. think that's one of the reasons why you have to, you can be more optimistic about this group than that group back in 2013. Raymond Felton was, he was actually the last best point guard that we had on for the Knicks team. No, I know. I know. It's been a long time. The days of Jared Jack. <laughs> think about these guys. Uh, Ron Baker. <laughs> What's that? Ron Baker. Ron Baker. Alonzo Trier. Remember, Alonzo Trier under Fisdale started that season opener at point guard. That's right. Isozo. Right. right. 
all these point guards that they had. It's and none of them, and even Langston Galloway, who's on Phoenix, by the way. That's right. Boy, he's carved out. I, you know, out of nowhere, got some run with the Knicks, and now enough money probably where he won't have to worry about it. Bless him. You know, he's done really well financially. He he has. I want to get into your beginnings as a broadcaster and your inspiration behind it because originally when you moved out to California you were attracted to the voices for the Golden State Warriors yeah Bill King Bill King oh, yeah man. the best uh you know back in that era he called when he were watching tv it was also the radio call so it was a simulcast mm -hmm. and I, I I didn't you know we didn't have Marv Albert out there growing up obviously Bill King was Incredible. Now, he never got a run or an opportunity on national TV, but he was the Raiders guy. He was a Warriors guy. He baseball. He was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, he was the guy that I listened to. So I always aspired actually to be an NBA radio play by play person. But coming out of college, the opportunities were more prevalent in affiliate TV, working at a station as a sportscaster. You know, there's two different career tracks. There's a play by play in this in the studio. And I've just always been a studio guy. And doing the MSG. Before we get into MSG, do you have time at ESPN, ESPN2? And you were able to work alongside Stuart Scott and Chris yeah. Berman. Yep, I had a great run there. In fact, Stuart and I started within a week or two of each other in 93. Uh, we were two of the original hires on ESPN2. Uh, and then uh, one of the highlights of my run at ESPN was in 95, 96. I was one of the guys... Uh, on NFL primetime, which back in the middle 90s was the signature NFL highlight show from seven to eight. Remember, that's pre internet, that's before the red zone, that's before all this cable, it's before all the internet. And that was a place where everybody watched seven o'clock on Sundays, Chris Berman, Tom Jackson. And for two years, I got a, a, a run on that to, to watch uh, everybody watch that for their NFL highlights. It was probably the, the, the most exposure I've ever gotten. And uh, working next to Chris Burn for a couple of years, a wonderful guy to me, was, was definitely one of the highlights of my career. In the 90s, in which the time you were on, that was the prime time to really be on ESPN. This is when you had all the listeners, and there wasn't all these other outlets that you have today on social media and all these other podcasts out here. But you had to watch ESPN to get your sports news. Think about it. If you were a Tigers fan, okay, in 1997, mm -hmm. and you – and you weren't living in Detroit, there was no other place except baseball tonight or the sports center to find out who won. Think about it. no Twitter, mm -hmm. no internet. I mean, what, 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 what was, I mean, how old are you? When were I'm you 22? Born? When were you born? 1999. Okay. So yeah, I mean, this is before you were even born. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that back then there was no NFL network. There was no MLB network. There was not all these regional channels. It was MSG, but there wasn't S and Y. There wasn't Yes. There wasn't Comcast. ESPN was it. So that was why at that time, that was, uh, it's still obviously a major entity, but that was the pinnacle of ESPN. I think the middle to late 1990s. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as though that social media has kind of, I wouldn't say degraded, but kind of ruined radio and TV in a, in a way, because you have so many voices out there as it, where people that are in the industry and are on TV every night, it, they're just, you can just get your news. They don't have to look to you as much anymore. See, what's interesting is that when I was on ESPN, we were the people that presented the news. Mm -hmm. Now everybody knows the results. So the people that are on are giving their take on the result. It's a huge difference from what it used to be. We didn't have this edi editorialization back in the 90s. We came on, we gave you the, the highlights, but we didn't pass judgment on the highlights. Now it's passing judgment, making opinion on what's happened. And not only is that how the cable networks are, but because of social media, as you mentioned, because of YouTube, everybody has a voice. You know, everybody wants to be on, everybody wants to be a star, everybody's got a podcast. So there's so much out there now. It's just a completely different world. And I think it's difficult, I think, to be as relevant. It was much easier to be on ESPN in the 90s than it would be now to try and, and, and grab a footprint. Yeah, that's what I've been learning throughout my four years in college because I'm someone who loves the passion of a live on air radio. I love listening to WFAN ESPN radio because that's what I want to do 
as a, as a job. It doesn't even have to be on those stations, but I want to be on live radio and everyone out here has a podcast. It's kind of, if you think of it like this, not everyone can make the starting five in the NBA. Not everyone can play basketball. And I feel as though with the digital age and social media, everyone has a podcast. It puts you at a disadvantage because everyone's doing it. And even Mike Francesa has spoken about it on his show. He's like, I don't know where I would have been back then if I had to grow up in this age with social media because everyone has a show. But on, on the flip side, you have your microphone and you're doing an interview with me. Yeah. <laughs> and all the other people you talk to, you wouldn't be doing this 10 years ago. No, you're right. So like for someone like you who's trying to develop your skills, this is a, this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully you have a good body of work with these interviews. You can mail them out and get a crack somewhere, you know? Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's the way to do it nowadays, but in getting an agent, because that's important too in the industry for anyone listening to right now, how do you go about getting an agent, especially as a broadcaster and someone that works for TV, especially in sports? Well, you know, a lot of these agents uh, sign people. I think it's really hard to, the agents just remember they're in business to make money. Mm -hmm. They will sign you if they think they can place you and make money from you. And therefore when you're just starting out, there's no point. Mm -hmm. so you probably need someone after you get established to help you negotiate, maybe help you move up. Uh, but it, it's not something that that's going to help as you start because you don't want them speaking on your behalf to yeah. entry level opportunities. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you become, you know, at a, at a certain level, they can help. Uh, but in a lot of cases, unfortunately it's, it's, they can't change the opinion of the person doing the hiring. That's one thing people need to understand. The people doing the hiring have to like you. If they don't like your work, it doesn't matter what agent you have. That's a good point right there. Yeah, it's it's insane, but that's that's the way it goes in the business, 100% about that. And speaking, when I brought up Mike Francesa before, you've also had the chance to host the B team on Mad Dog Radio with his ex-partner, Mad Dog. Yeah, so I didn't work with Mad Dog, but I was- You worked on his station. Right. I was on there. Boy, Mad Dog's the best. Yeah. <laughs> I loved him. I was, uh, after I, I was uh, done with ESPN before MSG, I actually was on Sirius XM for uh, a year. And then I did MSG and Sirius XM uh, together for about a year. And that to me, because I've always been a TV guy, hosting a radio show is when I had to do those shows uh, when my partner Bruce Murray was off and I had to do the whole thing alone. Oh my God, that, that is, see, when you're used to being a TV host, you're, you're brief, you're succinct, but on radio, you gotta, you gotta expand, you gotta go longer. It was a huge benefit to me and my career, even at that relatively late stage in my career to be able to have that experience because there's no script, you're winging it. It, it made me a much better TV host having that experience. So you feel as though radio does give a TV personality an edge? Well, the, here's the thing. If you're a radio person going to TV, you got to tighten it up. Mm -hmm. You cannot be <laughs> long-winded and not concise and be a studio TV host. If you're a TV host and you go to the radio, you got to lengthen it out. Mm -hmm. You got to expand and not be succinct. I mean, if you listen to these radio guys, Sometimes their questions are two and a half minutes long. They are. <laughs> and that doesn't work in a TV studio. Yeah, no, it's, it's two different mediums. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've always been a TV host. I had a huge adjustment to go uh, into the uh, radio studio. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great thing for my career, but you also have to be more opinionated than I, I tend to be. So uh, it's really probably not my, my comfort zone, but it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. MSG 150. You came to the MSG network in 2009. That's when you started. Right. And then uh, thankfully, uh, I, I shortly thereafter, in addition to my hosting duties, I work with this producer, Jeff Ostella, who comes up with this two and a half minute highlight segment on the Knicks and the Rangers that has been hugely popular because the guy, Jeff puts together the, the, the most fun clips. We have so much fun with it. And uh, it's something that's really caught on over the years. And I, that's something that I also really enjoy doing uh, when I, when I work at MSG. You've also been trying to apply more to the youth and bringing up terms such as no cap, no cap, no kizzy. Yeah. <laughs> I get it from my daughters who are in their twenties. They think I'm nuts. <laughs> Do you know what poggers means? 
No, I don't know what that means. You know what no cap means? I'm not kidding around, no cap. Yeah, I know what that no means. Key, no cap. Yeah, I know what that one is, too. Key, no cap. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's all these words that always come out in these decades. I remember back in the 90s, if you think about word up, that was one of them, too. Right, right. All these phrases that come about. He put it in a bag. Yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah. <laughs> I got to look up my list. I, I don't have it. I don't have it handy. Uh, when did the MSG 150 start for you? Because that's what you're most known for on the MSG network, as well as covering the the post game and pregame for the Knicks and the yeah, Rangers. I think uh, maybe 11, 12, maybe uh, 12, 13, maybe. I don't know. We've been doing it a long time, but it's yeah, Jeff Ostell, the producer is so creative. It makes it fun to come to work because you never, you never know what he's going to come up with, you know? It's interesting to watch you do them because you cover the whole league in 150 seconds. It's insane. It's like, how do you cover all this in the one small segment? It's, it's insane. Yeah. Short highlights, Max, you know, a yeah. couple plays here, a couple plays there and move on. And uh, well, I think it's because I'm on radio. So I have to analyze everything right in, in bigger, in bigger waves. Whereas like I was saying before, if you're on the radio, you don't, you got to go a lot longer. We just, it's right up my alley, hang yeah. it out and move on. <laughs> and how is it working with Wally and Alan on? Awesome. We have, I think I'm biased. I think we have great chemistry. We've been out it a long time. Thankfully we had a winner to cover this past year, you know, (laughs) and uh, yeah, we have a lot of fun. What a change of scenery. What's that? A a change of scenery. No question. It it helps when they win. I'll Mm -hmm. tell you that. You could tell that Alan, especially when he was doing the the broadcast from his basement this year, due to the pandemic, you could see the chemistry even coming through on the zoom call with you guys and just the excitement. You could tell that all three of you are Knicks fans. Yeah, we are. We kind of bleed uh, Knicks. Yeah. (laughs) We're not, we're not exactly unbiased. No. (laughs) Uh, It's, but when they lose, you, you you still do your job. That's the main thing. Yeah. Well, we're good at we're gotten good at it you know what i mean yeah <laughs> let's just tell you it's a lot easier when they win yeah when they lose i it's so hard i can only imagine for you guys just being fans and having the breakdown especially these seasons that we've had prior remember uh alexi shved when he alexi was on the shved? team yeah yeah <laughs> alexi shved yeah oh, we've got, remember billy walker oh yeah billy oh, walker oh these guys you samuel dallenbert Yep. Uh, Chris Duhon. Oh, oh, Lou Amundsen. I'm, 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 I mean, some of these fringe guys. <laughs> Lou oh, my God. Shane Larkin. Shane Larkin. Yep. There have been a lot of guys that have uh, gone through, man. A lot of guys. Brutal. Uh, Aaron Aflalo. Aaron Aflalo. Keep going. You're naming, naming them all. <laughs> Jared Jeffries. I remember when he had the Band-Aid on his eye. You know, isn't it? You know, one time uh, he was out for general soreness. Oh, he was? He, you know, and the injury report, it said general soreness. <laughs> so we started calling him general soreness. Uh, Landry Fields. He was, another, he was another high draft pick. Yeah, well, he had a really good year. You know, you know, made guys a ton of money is Mike D'Antoni. Mm-hmm, that's right. All the guys at Boris Diaw. Uh, Joe Johnson, and then with the Knicks, Steve Novak, uh, Mike Bibby, uh, Duhon made a ton of money with Dan Tony. I mean, it's just a guy goes on and on those guys from Phoenix. Um, Leandro Barbosa, wherever Dan Tony goes, he makes guys money. Landry Fields. Remember went to Toronto, I think for 16, Novak got 16 million. I think Landry Fields. Playing that year with uh, D'Antoni got twelve million. Mm-hmm. Or how about the horrific trade, Andrea Bargani? That was a oh, talk about disastrous trades. But, yeah, well, that didn't work out too well. No, I think the I think the Knicks won the Porzingis trade though. You know, that's very interesting to see how that's worked out. I, yeah, you know, AP's got all that money. He's not work. He's not fitting in right now. Um, yeah, you know, when all is said and done, that may have been a good thing to do. You know, if you had KP, you wouldn't have signed Randall. Nope. It's too bad Dennis Smith didn't work out. That That's the one thing about that trade. But you know what? You got D. Rose for Dennis Smith. Yeah. Think about and, that. And that's D. Rose was on the Knicks two years ago. He right. was number 25. Around, you got D. Rose for Dennis Smith. Yeah. 
Bill Jackson came in here. It was brutal. I, I'm thankful for Tom Thibodeau. I was wrong about him because I thought he was going to come in here, and I had Frank Isola on the show, and I said, there goes RJ's knees. But I, he proved me wrong on that. Thibodeau came in here, won head coach of the year. He's well deserved. Coach. I think he, he gets these guys to buy in. Uh, they were unified. They worked hard. They play hard every night. I, I, he's a, you know, I think it's a real challenge to get these guys to buy in in this in the NBA. And and Tibbs, no matter where he goes, he always gets his players to play hard. You got to give him a ton of credit. Yeah, it's nothing like the Derek Fisher years, David Fisdale years, Kurt Rambis. Hornacek. Oh, the, I think Hornacek was the worst years, in my opinion. Well, if you go back, Max, people don't remember this, but they were pretty good that one year. And Hardaway had a stress fracture. Mm -hmm. They started, I think, 17 and 14. And then KP tore his ACL. And that was the end of that season. If Hardaway stays healthy and KP stays healthy, that team may have been decent. Mm -hmm. I remember that because I remember I took to social media as soon as KP tore his ACL. I was like, None of my teams could ever have good luck. There's always something bad that happens because I'm a Jets fan too. I'm a Jet Met Nick Ranger fan and haven't seen any of my teams win any rings. Well, I the Jets, I, you <laughs> know, maybe this coach will be good. Maybe the new quarterback will be good. But, you know, KP is just, uh, he can't post up. He, he's a jump shooter. He's not defending well. And he's making a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of a diva here. You know, I, I think it's a, it, they, they ultimately may have known something. A lot of us didn't necessarily agree at the time, but uh, that may have turned out to be one heck of a move. And his brother was always trying to get him more money. He was always saying something to the media that was causing some backlash, making it difficult. Yep. Yep. So, you know, Dallas has got major issues now. Yeah. They do, 100%. What are you doing in your off time now besides doing interviews and watching the finals coming up here? You got the Eastern Conference, Western Conference finals still going on. Yeah, I'm watching some of the hockey. Oh, the I'm hockey game. The That's playoffs. Right. My wife's a great cook. I'm trying not to get fat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I get kind of get, uh, get get bored quickly. I, uh, you know, we got the draft in late July. I'm looking forward to that. And, you know, before, before uh, you know, it'll be time for the season to start again. So. Free agency here in August. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. Tampa Bay Lightning versus the Canadians. Who do you think is going to win this series? Well, I don't know if you know this, but Tampa's up one nothing in game That's two. That's right. You see that? They oh, I, I didn't see game two. I wasn't watching the game, but I know they're up game right one now. nothing already. They're up one nothing in game two. I think Tampa's going to win in, in four or five games. Yeah. They, they looked at what they did to the Islanders two years in a row. Yeah. Islanders just, just coming up short. That's all. It's That's all. How do you feel as a, as a Ranger fan about the Islanders or is there still that intense hatred for each other? Like there was back in the day. I think it's, you know, as the teams get good. Yes. The Islanders are a great team. They, play, they just need a little more scoring. You know, they, they just, they just, they've come so close now, two straight years. I mean, they lost to Tampa. Tampa won the cup last year and Tampa may win the cup this year and Islanders have played them tough. They got some roster decisions to make because of the cap, but boy, Brayard Trotz is a great coach. And of course, Lou Lamarillo is a fantastic executive. Yeah. They've done an amazing job with that Islanders team two years in a row, but I hope, I mean, I'm a Ranger fan, but I don't want to see the window close on them because I was rooting for them because for me, I didn't grow up in the era of when the Rangers and the Islanders were basically rivals that the way they, way they were in the back in the day. Or you look at the the eighties when you hear used to hear the fans of the Islanders go to the to the Rangers nineteen forty, <laughs> right? Well, you know the Islanders have uh, done a great job, and hopefully the Rangers can make some additions here. Obviously, have a new coach, new management. Hopefully, they can take the next step. I'm hearing they may have to lose some players to make some splashes in free agency. Who's that? The Islanders? The Rangers? Ah, uh, we'll see. I don't know. I mean, if they trade for Jack Eichel, they're going to have to give up a lot of pieces. But I think they have some uh, they have some flexibility to get some. They need some veteran uh, toughness for sure. How did it feel to win an Emmy in your career? Uh, great. You know, the 150s won. We actually had nominations out today. The, the 150s uh, nominated again. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm up for uh, sports host. 
uh, which I've never won before. I've been nominated. Hopefully I win this year. We got a great crew. You know, when you're on Max, mm -hmm. you're only as good as the people behind you that work with you. And we have an incredible production team. Nick's producer, Spencer Julian cues our pre and post game producer uh, for the home games. Spencer this year did the, did the road games. Uh, he, he produces the games themselves. Paula McHale, our Rangers producer, uh, John Gallagher is our director. We just have a great crew and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just been a great experience uh, to work at MSG. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, a lot of us got nominated. Mike Breen got nominated for play-by-play, -play, Brendan Burke for play-by-play, -play, Val Aquette, uh and Clyde for uh, best analyst. Hopefully we'll, we'll all end up taking home the hardware this year. It's well-deserved, especially when you guys cover our favorite teams in the, the tri-state area, especially the Knicks and the Rangers. It's, those are the two teams are definitely the heart of New York. You would say the Yankees too, of course, but then there's something about that Knicks team. Do you think out of all the New York teams that haven't won in a while, you think if the Knicks won a championship, the city would just explode? I think so. Yeah. I, you know, the Yankees are, are really, they're, it's a huge baseball town. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, the Knicks, I, I think, yeah, uh, all of it. I, I don't think you could say it would be more for the Knicks than any other team. If the Giants won, the Giants have won. Can you imagine if the Jets became a, a <sighs> contender? I mean, yeah, it's a great it's a great sports town, and uh, you know the Knicks have their loyal fan base, and you could just sense it as we've talked about the the the, the excitement building last year uh, with how they were doing and going into the playoffs. Hopefully, it continues into next year. You think there would be that same uproar? And I, I want it from you because you work with MSG and you're a Knicks fan. You work for the Knicks. Would it be the same reaction if the Nets won the championship in New York? I, New I just York don't fans, think they, they don't have the, 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 as we talked about, the history of the traction. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I didn't get the sense that during the playoffs, the, the city was going bananas for the Nets. Did you? No, I didn't. But I did watch the playoff games against the Bucks. There were a lot of fans in that building. I don't know if they were necessarily Nets fans, but I was surprised how many fans were in Barclays. I right. was very surprised. Well, I mean, you're going to come watch a playoff game. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, they just don't have the institutional support that the Knicks have. No, it's and they don't they don't make as much noise as they do for the Knicks games. They don't the fans. It's it's totally different. The Garden is the loudest arena in sports. And you saw it during the play against Atlanta. So unbelievable. Yeah, it, it really was. And a fun fact, you were actually born on April 20th. I'm, I'm born on April 20th. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, there's something about the Zodiac there. What I yeah. mean, are you, are you good? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> My family thinks I'm a little off, off center. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, are, you, uh, are you really intense? No, I'm not really intense. I'd say. Okay. Are you really passionate? I'm passionate. Yeah. I think that's part of being born on April 20th. That's wild. Yeah, April. To, yeah, that's a fun fact, though, because when I was doing my research, I was like, wow, I never knew you were born on April 20th. I'm a lot older than you. What are you, like 22? Yeah. Okay. Born in, you said, 99? Mm-hmm. Jesus. <laughs> 1965 is when you were born. That's right. It's a special year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We, if if this didn't happen, we wouldn't be getting the MSG 150. That's right. That's right. It, it I, wouldn't. Thank you for having me on, man. It's great to talk to you. Oh, of course. Anything else you would love to tell the audience up here? No, yeah. just, uh, you know, go Knicks and best of luck to you. Thank you, Bill Pito. I want to thank you again for coming on the show and go Knicks. Okay, Max. Talk to you soon. Okay, buddy. Yep. Enjoy the rest of your night too. You too, buddy. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Of course. Okay. Anytime. Okay. See you. Bye. See you.